It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Acting Premier. Yesterday, British Columbia's Minister of Education made a surprising offer to Ontario's teachers. He said that while Ontario may not want teachers, BC certainly does. In fact, they're holding job fairs in Ontario, hoping to poach our frontline educators because, to quote the minister, Teachers are interested in coming to British Columbia because, first and foremost, there is a government that is supportive of public education here." End quote. Was it the government's intention to start a talent drain of educators leaving Ontario, or are they willing to consider this as a sign that their attack on world-class educators isn't working? Questions to the Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. The premise that the opposition leader is trying to perpetuate is absolutely ridiculous. We stand by our teachers and we stand by making sure we have the best learning environments in the classroom across Canada. That said, we also are making sure, though, that our education system in Ontario is sustainable. And we That's presented right. on March 15th a plan for education, a plan that works for you, that has been embraced by everyone in this province in the sense that we're touching on the important parts of job skills and life skills that students sorely have been lacking because of the failed experiments and ideology that yeah. the Liberal administration inflicted upon classrooms over the last 15 years. We were given a mandate Fonts. last June to get education in Ontario back on track, and that is exactly what we're doing. Right. And Test people will be embracing our plan because, again, the yeah. fact of the matter is. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Well, Speaker, parents, students, and teachers are finding it hard to believe the Premier's and the Minister's claims. In fact, last weekend, thousands of students, parents, and educators, uh, education workers rather, from across Ontario came to be heard in unprecedented num uh, numbers in a demonstration that took place on the lawn. They know that larger classes mean schools will soon be losing shop classes, music classes, and the teachers who teach them. Yesterday, the Premier said that not one single teacher is going to lose their job, but school board after school board is announcing cuts. How many teaching positions will this government eliminate before they admit that teachers are actually losing their jobs? Speaker, honestly, you would think the Leader of the Opposition would have more integrity than fear-mongering like she's consistent to do she's day after day after day. Okay. I'm going to caution the Minister and, and remind all members that intemperate language leads to disruption in the House. We have to have a reasonable debate over the course of this question period. I'd ask the Minister to conclude her response. Thank you very much. Because when it comes to the actions that school boards are taking over the recent weeks, that's routine Every annual year. activity where they take a look at their roster, they, they evaluate how many teachers are retiring, how many teachers are redeploying, how many teachers are actually resigning, and then they reallocate teachers accordingly. And so it's just part and parcel of an annual process that, that is Response. Absolutely irresponsible to use as a as an, as an excuse to fearmonger and make teachers That's think they that do. they're going to be losing their jobs. Chicken because, little. quite frankly, Speaker, we're going to be looking to hire more elementary. And more Thank you. Elementary. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all due respect, I think that the school boards know more than the minister about what's happening in their classrooms at their schools. The Premier expects students, parents and workers on the front line in our schools to ignore the facts. The thousands of people on the lawn this weekend shows how believable that is. Speaker. Toronto's board has sent notice to 1,000 teachers, telling them there are no jobs for them next year. In York Region, they're eliminating 300 teachers. In Peel, 500. In Kawartha, 90. In Hamilton, 136. In Waterloo, the Catholic board is eliminating 22 jobs next year. How can thousands of teaching jobs disappear in communities across Ontario? while the Premier claims not a single job has been lost. Does the minister think that maybe he needs a math refresh? Uh -huh. Well, I would suggest, Speaker, that the Leader of the Opposition needs an education herself because, quite frankly, yeah. it's the school boards that they are 
the school boards act as the employers of the teachers. She needs to get that straight and stop the fear mongering. Because quite frankly, we're taking a look at how to improve education after 15 failed years under the Liberal administration. And quite frankly, one thing Ontario can guarantee uh, will be a result from us: we will never ever use the classroom as a soapbox to perpetuate fear mongering. Exactly. Because we have a job to do, Speaker, and that's that job is to get education back on track. We are not going to be bullied by unions. We're not going to be put off key by fear mongering. We're focusing on getting students back to the wow. basics. They're going to learn math. They're going to they learn job skills. They're, they're going to learn life skills. Gone. Because A, teachers, parents, and students have asked for it, and B, we're going to deliver because we want those students graduating with the skills they need for the jobs. Thank you. Next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also for the Acting Premier. Uh, the Premier has gone on record in this House accusing the organizers behind the Students Say No campaign as being pawns for teachers' unions, dismissing their hard work and the voices of over 100,000 students who supported them. Yesterday, the Premier had an opportunity to apologize for those comments, but he, refu he refused. One of the young organizers is here with us today. She was, uh, uh, she was um, introduced by one of our members. Uh, my question, of course, is to the Premier. Unfortunately, I guess it's the Acting Premier that's going to have to answer it. Um, will they— Order. 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 The government side, come to stop the clock. Stop the clock. Yeah. Order. Do I need to say again? that from time to time members might be away. Some of us are not here every day. We don't take attendance, but some of us aren't here. That's why we don't make reference to the absence of each other, because sometimes we're away for good reasons. I'll remind all members once again. Restart the clock, and the, the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition can conclude her question. Well, Speaker, the question is, will the Premier apologize to her and the other young people who, even if the Premier and the government disagree with them, should at least give them credit for having their own opinions? Questions to the Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Education. Thank you very much. And speaker, it's my opinion that past behaviour is indicative of future behaviour, and we know in the past union bosses, union bosses organised student walkouts under the previous Liber Liberal government. Uh -huh. they, they organised against Bob Ray's government. The they organised against yeah. the Liberal government. It's just routine. Now. It's just a practice. But what I can tell you as well is, and I want to be perfectly clear, no one, including the unions, get, a, get to veto our education plan. No one is going to stop us from getting education back on track and delivering value for students and their families. Ontario parents, it's the tax dollars generated from Ontario parents that pay for our education here in Ontario, and they deserve better than what they've been getting. And we stand beside parents Response. across this province, Speaker, when we say we've listened, and the plan that I introduced on March 15th demonstrates that. Once and for all, education in Ontario is going to work for parents. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary question. Speaker, we know about past behaviour, like the last time the Conservatives were in government and cut, cut, cut education in Ontario to the point where we had less than 70 per cent of high school students graduating. Less than 70 per cent graduated under that time, uh, under the Inside last time order. the government uh, across the way was in office in this province. But look, the letter that uh, the student organizers of the province uh, walkout um, put together says this. To claim that this walkout was organized, orchestrated, or puppeteered by adults is not only false, but extremely insulting to the young people of Ontario. So my question is to the um, the government, if they would care to listen, uh, uh, these students want to know, uh, will the government acknowledge that the resounding success of the Student Say No campaign was born out of the hard work of students across the province, government like side, Natalie and Rain fisher Kwan, who is with us here in the House today? Stop the clock. 
there were numerous outbursts from the government side. I could barely hear the person asking the question, the leader of the opposition. Come to order. Start the clock. Minister to reply. Well, Speaker, we are never going to take a history lesson from the leader of the opposition. Because if we were to take a look at history, uh, just a few decades ago, under Bob Ray and the NDP government, 100,000 people were out of work. A million people were on social assistance. And I can tell you that we are developing an education plan that will guarantee our future generations will never have to experience that again. We're focusing on an education system that's going to get people to work. Our education system is getting back to the basics, and we're embracing amazing things that people spoke about in our consultation last fall. Never before has mental health be, been a focus like we're going to be focusing on. Never before has skilled trades been embraced like this Response. government, and we are going to get it right. 100,000 jobs are waiting for people interested in skilled trades, and we need to embrace that. We need to celebrate it and encourage students to pursue the careers in Ontario. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's really quite unfortunate for the students of Ontario that this minister doesn't know that you're doomed to repeat history if you don't remember it. They should remember their history in government and not doom our students to repeating that history, Speaker. Students across the province have tried every possible way to get this government to listen to what they have to say, and the government's only solution is to pretend that the students didn't even say it. They don't want larger classes, Speaker. They don't want students to lose music class or shop class. They don't want thousands of teachers to lose their jobs and leave the province. In summary, they don't want a premier slicing and dicing their education. They want a good future here in Ontario instead of pretending that they don't exist, why won't this Premier and his government listen to what they have to say? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I have to tell you, Speaker, let's use our example of the fall consultation. We listened to over 72,000 respondents, parents, students, teachers, grandparents, employers, and honestly, we're getting it right because they chose to, to contribute their voice in a, a forum that allowed online consultation, telephone town halls, as well as written submissions. We are moving forward on research that matters, qualitative and quantitative. It's qualitative research that we have to really take a look at because, again, you know, in opposition to the fear-mongering that's coming from across the House here, there is no research that says smaller classrooms are indicative and, re and correlate to student success. Because the fact of the matter is, take a look at our own Liberal government and what they achieved. Oh. Declining math scores and poor student success. And fact of the matter is. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, once again, the leader of the official opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is to the acting premier. But I have to say, of the thousands of parents and students that I talk to, not a single one has told me that they want larger classrooms and fewer adults in the schools. Not a single one, Speaker. Yesterday, the Minister of Health said, and I quote, there's a lot of health care that is delivered privately, and as a result, we should not be concerned about the expansion of private for-profit care, apparently. Uh, in the uh, acting premier's view, should there be any limit at all on how big a role private for-profit care should play in our health care system? The question is to the deputy premier. Uh, thank you very much for the question, but I believe, through you, Mr. Speaker, that the leader of the official opposition is tr trying to put words in my mouth yep. with things that I did not say. What I did indicate, and the fact of the matter is that there already is private delivery in the health care system, yeah. but it is paid for with public dollars. So doctors, for example, in private practice, they're entrepreneurs. They are pri in private practice. Should we not have doctors anymore? Should we not have pharmacists? Should we not have labs? It's not practical. Order. Government side, come to order. I apologize to the deputy premier. I had to interrupt her because of the evasion on the government side. I couldn't hear the minister answering the question. 
Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, come to order. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will come to order. Restart the clock. Question, sub supplementary question. Speaker, but I would say to the government that private, uh, the private failing of our private home care system rather, is not something that this government should be proud of. It was the Conservatives that privatized home care, and it is one heck of a mess in our province. So that's right. if that's what they're so proud of, I think they should take a double look at what it is that they've done in the past. But here's what families are worried about. The same Premier who said he would leave no stone unturned when it comes to privatization is re refusing to set limits on how much private for-profit care can creep into our system. Families know what that means. It means less care, more and longer waits, and more fees. If the Premier isn't determined to plow ahead with privatization, why is the government defeating NDP amendments to their health bill that would prevent a massive increase in privatization in our health care system? Before I ask for a response, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services needs to come to order, as does the Minister, the member for King Vaughan. Start the clock. Response, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, again, through you, Speaker, I, I think it's really important to say that the uh, system of our health care is as it is now, not as the uh, leader of the official opposition and the official opposition would like it to be. This has been the situation in Ontario for many, many years. We are not changing any of that. What we are doing is to strengthen like our to public health care system. That's here, here. what Bill 74 actually speaks to. Here, here. And we are going determined to do that. We are going to make sure that our public health care system is strengthened, that local health care providers perform the, the needs of local communities, that they provide the care that's necessary, that we take away some of the boundaries that have existed before in the Ministry of Health to allow that integrated care to happen, all within the context of our public health care response. system. Response. Next question. The member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. As a proud daughter and daughter-in-law of retired teachers, it's concerning. It's really concerning to hear all the misinformation being spread about what our government is doing to support teachers. Mr. Speaker, I heard it loud and clear when knocking on doors in Etobicoke Lakeshore that students are leaving their classrooms without being prepared for the real world. Our government knows that our student supports start at home, but we also know, need to be sure that they are getting the best sports inside the classrooms. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Education tell us what our government is doing to ensure that our education system is back on track and to ensure that we have the best teachers in our classrooms? Questions addressed to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke Lakeshore. I have many teachers in my family as well, and I can appreciate exactly what your parents are feeling. So, Speaker, as Minister of Education, I'm so glad to talk about the great work that our teachers are doing in our classrooms. We know Ontario has some of the best teachers in the world, and it's something we're very proud of, and it's something that we can invest in and support more in terms of what they do in the classroom. And that's why I'm so pleased to share with everyone today that we're going to be providing full funding for every teacher in Ontario who wants to get additional qualifications in math. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. This is about investing in our educators to get it right for our students once and for all. We understand the difficult job teachers have, but what we don't want to do is to allow another generation of students to get left behind without the skills they need for the jobs of today and tomorrow. This is about getting it right, and we look forward to working with our teachers across this parents so parents have confidence in our Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary question. Through you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response. I am so grateful that we have a government that is ready to support all of our students and our teachers. I know that this government is focused on getting it right for our teachers. Right. But Mr. Speaker, 
I know that well that we have an outdated hiring practices. They also allow they allow situations where our teachers are not able to find the job they wanted. Can the minister help us and talk to us about what our government is doing to propose so that our teachers can get the job that is right for them? Great question. Again, thank you very much to the member from the minister. Lakeshore. I, I appreciate her question very much because as a member of the opposition, I heard this from teachers for years. We heard it through our consultation loud and clear that we need to increase teacher mobility. The previous government sadly instituted outdated hiring practices, Speaker, that rewarded teachers based on seniority and did not recognize teachers who were excelling at their jobs. That needs to change, and we're going to get that job done. Mr. Speaker, I've said it before and I'll repeat it now. We need to ensure that we have the right teacher in the right classroom. Here, here. And our proposal to allow Not new teachers teacher. direct access to apply to permanent Not positions in any school street. board is a step here towards accomplishing just that. And this isn't about an outdated, Rod, outdated Rod, regulation. This day. is about doing the right thing for our response. students <laughs> and the right move for our teachers. <laughs> We're standing by our teachers. We're making sure the best teachers are in the classroom, doing what they they enjoy by supporting not only their education but also making sure thank you the next question member for thank you speaker my question is to the minister of education the recent policy change that your government has announced for uh, increasing class size for secondary classes could lead to something in rural schools northern schools small schools called class stacking Yep. So you don't have enough students in grade 9 applied, so you throw in an academic, and then maybe you throw in grade 10. And what at, what's ultimately going to happen is parents and kids are going to notice that the teacher can't keep up, and they're going to look for another school, a bigger school. How can this government claim to be wanting to protect rural schools, yet implement policies that in the end are going to close the school in my hometown and yep. going to close the school in the minister's hometown? How can we do that? Questions to the Minister of Education. Well, first things first. We stood up against the former Liberal government uh -huh. in closing 600 Untrue. schools. Jeez. We stood up against Jeez. that. And secondly, Jeez. I can tell you that, Speaker, we will never, ever play politics with the success and well-being of our students, no matter where they are in, in Ontario. It doesn't matter whether it's urban Ontario or rural Ontario. The fact of the matter is our education plan that works for you was highlighted on March 15th, and that very day I opened up consultations for our education partners to hear from them, to, to work with them through to May 31st, to hear how we can move forward together to making sure we get it right for every student across Ontario. And I look forward to their input because, again, we want to make sure the learning environment in Bonds. the classroom is absolutely improved improved, making sure that our students are focusing in on the basics and the fundamentals that will ensure that they have great opportunities in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. I asked about class stacking, didn't get an answer, but as small schools close across rural Ontario, the students are going to be bused farther and farther. And you know what? The school bus will pick up the student in the morning and the school bus will pick up or bring the student home in the afternoon. But you know what doesn't follow students in many places in rural Ontario? Broadband, actual usable internet. You guys want to have four secondary school classes, e-learning, but in many cases the only place that those kids are going to do that is at school or in the library. Come on. Rural Ontario needs the same access as the rest of the province. How can you talk about e-learning when students in rural Ontario don't have access to usable, accessible broadband? Members, please take their seats. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. And it gives me an opportunity to stand up in this House and congratulate the Minister of Infrastructure for the announcement. Hey! Once again, I'll remind members to make your comments through the floor. I can't hear you when you turn your back to me. 
And secondly, um, as soon as the standing ovation started, I, I could not hear the member and had to interrupt. I would ask our guest to refrain from heckling the members, or you will have to leave. Government side come to order. The government side come to order. Trump supporter. Order. That reaction from the government side was not the least bit helpful to our security services, to our legislative protective service. The Minister of Education has the floor. Please restart the clock. Thank you very much, Speaker. And again, I want to thank the Minister of Infrastructure for following through on a commitment that we had made going into the election, and we carried through to this day. We're absolutely committed to make sure that all of Ontario has access to high-speed internet connectivity. Here, it's here. a promise we made, and it's a promise we're going to keep. Another and one. in doing that, in doing that very thing, and in investing in broadband across Ontario, and following through on our strategy, we're going to ensure that every home in Ontario and school has Box. access to high speed that will enable students to employ online learning. It's a tool that many colleges are already utilizing. It's a tool that they need. Thank you. Next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Indigenous Affairs. From day one, our government has been focused on lowering energy costs for low-income families, seniors and small businesses. We cancelled the Liberals' cap-and-trade scheme that made life unaffordable for the people of Ontario. Our government is putting money back in the pockets of families who are struggling to make ends meet. Now the federal government is imposing their own carbon tax, which came into effect on April 1st. Mr. Speaker, can the minister update us on how much Ontarians will pay under Justin Trudeau's carbon killing, <laughs> job killing carbon tax? That's a good question. Minister of Energy and Natural Resources. Uh, Thank you. Morning, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Scarborough Agent Court for his great work in his constituency and for raising this question in this place. At the heart of this, this is all about transparency, Mr. Speaker. That's why we followed the Auditor General's instructions when it came to being transparent about the real cost of electricity and the subsidies and moved it out onto their bills. That's why I wrote the Ontario Energy Board and it asked them to identify clearly on a line how much this job-killing carbon tax was going to increase their home heating bills. For businesses, Mr. Speaker, how much more expensive it was going to be to fire their manufacturing uh, plants, Mr. Speaker, to operate forestry uh, mills and, and mines, Mr. Speaker. Make no mistake about it, this is a tax on everything, Mr. Speaker. So how do we take that transparency to the next level? Well, if anything can, a sticker sure can, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to put stickers on gas pumps to remind the people of Ontario that gas has gone up 4.4 cents and 11 cents in the future, and we can't afford that, and we reject that tax. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It is clear that the minister takes the concerns of drivers across this province very seriously. It is important that drivers are aware of the adverse impact that Justin Trudeau's carbon tax will have on their day-to-day -day lives. When I speak to small business owners and families in my riding, they tell me that they are concerned. They are worried about the true cost of carbon tax will have. This carbon tax threatens the affordability and the competitiveness of our province. The federal carbon tax will increase the price of almost everything. Can the minister tell this House what other impacts the people of Ontario can expect? That's a good point. Minister. Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. The environment. Yeah. 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 
So, Mr. Speaker, thank you to the member for his question. And I was with the Minister of Energy, uh, Northern Development and Mines, just just yesterday in Oakville with the great member there, talking about these impacts, uh, and not just the impacts at the pump, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the impact on our hospitals, twenty-seven million dollars. The impact on our colleges and universities, twenty million dollars. Mr. Speaker, myself and the Minister of Seniors were with a couple last week, where Mr. Speaker, sitting in their kitchen, they talked about could they afford healthy food or would they be paying Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, these impacts will affect more than just families, more than just businesses. It will affect all Ontario. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, we will make sure that Ontarians know the cost of the Trudeau carbon tax. We'll make sure that we use every tool at our disposal, including going to the courts next week, joined by Manitoba, joined by Saskatchewan, to fight this carbon tax with every tool we have. Question. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Women in Ontario are still only earning 71 cents on the dollar compared to men, and racialized women take only 60 percent of what white men make. Closing the wage gap makes sense, Speaker. It's just the right thing to do. And honestly, Speaker, it's 2019. It is time. Speaker, the government should be taking meaningful steps to close the gender wage gap, but instead they have stalled the implementation of the Pay Transparency Act, all so that they can ask businesses how much of a burden it would be to pay women equally. Will the Premier reverse that decision and implement the Pay Transparency Act by May 1st? I look to the Deputy Premier. Thank you. Well, this is, in fact, the Ontario government's fifth equal pay day. And let me say from the outset that our government believes that men and women should be earning equal wages. There is still work that needs to be done on that. But, in fact, we have taken many steps. Right now, uh, since August 2018, the number of women involved in the workforce has increased by approximately 45,000 wow. women. 50% of all new businesses in Canada are led by women, and women wholly own or partially own 47% of all small and medium-sized enterprises. Wow. So progress is being made. We are meeting women's needs with innovative approaches to childcare, tuition, student loans, and microloans for entrepreneurs. And we continue to work with stakeholders and with women to find out the other solutions Bonds. to allow women to get into the workforce and certainly to make sure that they earn equal pay. Great answer. Great answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Thank Premier. Let me be clear to all the women in this province. Ensuring that you have equal pay for equal work is not a burden. It is not bureaucratic, and it is certainly not red tape. Pretty much what you said. Mr. Speaker, we are asking for a plan and a commitment, and women in this province should expect as much. Instead, we have a Minister of Labour saying one thing when she was in opposition and another thing when she was in government. Mr. Speaker, on April 11, 2017, the now Minister of Labour stated that the women of this province deserve equal pay for work of equal value, and yet they still do not have it. Will the Acting Premier ensure that this minister follows through on what she said in opposition when she was over here on this side of the bench? And ensure that all women receive equal pay for equal work and implement the Pay Transparency Act today. Members, please take their seats. Deputy Premier. Thank you. Well, the ministry is already working very hard to ensure that women receive equal pay for equal work. And as, as the member would know well, this is a legislated requirement under the Pay Equity Act of 1987. However, the Pay Transparency Act is something quite different. Order. And I think that you, the member, will know that the Pay Transparency Act is about reporting and publishing information about compensation. It is not about pay equity. That is what the Pay Equity Act deals with. Opposition but the Liberal government rushed out the Pay Transparency Act. It should be noted, just ahead of the last regulation the election, it contained no regulations, no guidelines, no information as how it would be enacted. And in fact, the members of the committee, the Gender Wage Gap Steering Committee, indicated that it would probably take three years Spons. for that to be enacted. So that is being worked on. We have delayed it so that we could enter into those consultations that must be had so that we understand exactly where we Thank you. 
Thank you. The member for Hamilton East Stony Creek and the member for Waterloo must come to order. Next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Education. Um, with the budget about to be introduced in the Legislature on Thursday, there are lots of rumours about uh, what may or may not be contained in the document, and one of the areas of concern, Mr. Speaker, is full-day kindergarten. Now, I know that the Minister has assured parents that, and children that FDK will remain in place, and that's a, a great thing, but there continue to be rumours about how the classroom might change. In the description of FDK on the Minister's website, the explanation of the teaching model is, and I quote, a teacher and an ECE working together to help young students learn during the regular school day. These educators have complementary skills that create a learning environment to support the unique needs of each child, unquote. In other words, Mr. Speaker, the team skills fit together, and that prepares the young child for, uh, for grade one, and those complex little beings get the support that they need. So will the minister Should. tell us today whether the current teaching model for full-day kindergarten will be maintained? Questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. And uh, first things first, I, I will absolutely make clear that we will not be closing the hundreds of schools like the member opposite's yeah. government did in previous 15 years. classes. We're not going to be doing that. And the other thing that we're going to be doing is focusing in on the fact that we want to ensure that parents have confidence when we talk about class sizes, not one change is going to happen with the class sizes from kindergarten to grade three. Less than one student per class will see um, in grades four to eight, not one student more, no more than one student is what I'm trying to say, will be seen as an increase in grades four to eight. And again, on, in terms of average class sizes in high school, secondary classes will go up to Lawrence. an average size of 28. And the CBC fact check of March 25th shows that those class sizes are some of the lowest across yeah. Canada. Yeah. In terms of kindergarten, we're going to get it right. Thank you. The member for Orléans has to come to order. Supplementary. So, oh, Mr. Speaker, it was actually a very straightforward question. It was a yes/no question, and that answer does not provide much assurance. And just, Mr. Speaker, I hope, I hope that on the issue of school closures, I hope the government's going to open the hundreds and hundreds of schools that we opened as well, Mr. Speaker. So. Mr. Speaker, I want to just ask again, given that the preliminary government research side order. from McMaster and Queen's Universities, also available on the minister's website, showed that, and I quote, overall students in FDK are better prepared to enter grade one and to be more successful in school, and in every area, students improved their readiness for grade one and accelerated their development. Does the minister agree that the current model is working, and is she advocating with her minister of finance, who is, I know, looking for cuts, but is she advocating for that complementary team that is working so well in full-day kindergarten? I'm going to once again ask the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry to come to order, Minister of, Nat Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to come to order, Minister to reply. Thank you very much. And speaker, again, when it comes to getting our young people on track, our four- and five-year-olds deserve the best start possible. And we're not going to be closing the schools the Liberals, like they did under the Liberal government, and that's where it all stops and starts. Over and above place. that, we're going to make sure that our young people get the best start possible, and that's by listening to our parents and focusing on the fundamentals and to make sure that we students. get it right. We want the best people in the classrooms. We just passed a bill last week that we celebrated safe and supportive classroom environments, and, and that's exactly what our government, our PC government, is going to achieve. And you know, the fact of the matter is, we absolutely embrace all the good learning techniques that are used in kindergarten straight through to secondary school, and we're going to be working to ensure that what matters to parents is that Response. quality education and they're, that they're getting their students off on the right track. And again, that's getting back to the basics and focusing on the fundamentals and making sure that our students are prepared for the jobs of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Next question, member for Ottawa West, Medea. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people is moving forward with our campaign commitment to modernize our public health care system and centre it squarely on the needs of patients, 
families, and caregivers. This is incredibly important for my constituency of Ottawa West Nepean because we have the largest seniors population in all of Ontario. An important part of this plan includes our commitment to adding 15,000 long-term care beds in the next five years. Can the minister please inform the members of this legislature on how this government is finally delivering results for Ontario seniors? Deputy Premier. Thank you, well, thank you very much care. to the member from Ottawa West Nepean for your question. Our government envisions a health care system that allows seniors to enjoy the highest possible quality of life and, when available, stay healthy at home, whether that's through home care services or retirement home communities. However, we have also committed to adding 15,000 new long-term care spaces within the next five years. In just nine months, we have already allocated over 7,200 wow. new wow. long-term care beds, fulfilling almost half of our commitment toward building these spaces within five years. Well done. Our government will ensure seniors will have a long-term care bed when and where they need it. Yeah. Well done. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the minister for her response. I am proud of the fact that our government is taking patient care so seriously by taking immediate action on this important issue. The previous government failed to address many of the most pressing issues facing Ontario's public health care system. My constituents and seniors across Ontario will certainly benefit from these new long-term care beds and spaces. Could the minister please explain, Mr. Speaker, why adding more long-term care capacity is part of our broader plan to strengthen Ontario's public health care system? Very good question. Minister. Well, thanks again to the member for the question, but adding more capacity to uh, long-term care will strengthen Ontario's public health care system by helping to reduce wait times for those who need care immediately. This will help take pressure off hospitals, allowing nurses and doctors to prepare and care for patients the way that they were trained to do, in proper rooms instead of hospital hallways and storage closets. Here, here. We envision a public health care system where patients and families will have access to better, faster and more connected services. A system where patients are supported when transitioning from one health care space to another, for example, from hospital to home care or from home or from uh, hospital to long-term care. The people, including Ontario's seniors, have been and always will be our government's top priority. Response. And we will create a health care system that works for them, for patients, for families, and for caregivers. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University, Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is a question for the Acting Premier. There's a report today in the Toronto Star indicating that neither the TTC, the Mayor of Toronto or City Council has any details about the Premier's hostile takeover of Toronto's subway system. No one at the City knows what the Premier is proposing for the relief line, whether it will be underground or overground, what route it will, be, it will take, how much it will cost or how long it will be delayed because of this Premier's antics. Why is the Acting Premier keeping the City of Toronto in the dark? Deputy Premier. The Minister of Transportation. Refer to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thanks, Member, for that question. And uh, uh, I, I would think the Member would also agree with me that the current uh, transportation system isn't working for the riders of this province. People aren't able to ride the uh, subway without it being overworked. And for decades, the City of Toronto has been unable to expand the subway network, and, and we're, we're taking to, uh, making way forward to make changes to that. We have been working with the City of Toronto since last year after Michael Lindsay was appointed our advisor, working towards a new partnership between the City of Toronto, the TTC, and the province of Ontario in order to upload the subway system where the province would take ownership of the rails, the stations, uh, take care of the maintenance, and the City of Toronto would continue to have the TTC run uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the TTC and at the same time keep the fares uh, that they're collecting today. It would be a new partnership that's going to be great not only for the people of Toronto, the GTHA as a whole, but for the rider. That's what the focus is going to be. And that's Number four, Ottawa Centre, the member for King Vaughan will come to order. Supplementary. 
Uh, back to the Acting Premier. The city has spent years in partnership with the province developing plans for the relief line, the Eglinton West LRT and the Young Subway extension. $200 million has been spent on planning, design and other work, and the city was nearly ready to launch the procurement process. But now the Premier wants to rip up these schemes and replace them with his own plan, setting us back years, costing us unknown millions of dollars. Why won't the Premier let the city get on with building transit instead of wasting even more time and money with this misguided, hostile takeover? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. We have been working closely with the City of Toronto for the last few months developing our terms of reference, which is leading towards the final conclusion of the upload of the subway system, which is going to create a new partnership, which will allow us to move forward with the expansions. Right now, there's been a lot of talk for decades. For decades, people have been waiting for the relief line uh, on the Young Line, Mr. Speaker, and unfortunately, they've been unable to deliver. It's not the fault of any one particular person. It's the system that's the fault. It's a system that needs change, Mr. Speaker. We're proposing a change to that system so that actually we can take these plans and turn them into projects. And under the leadership of Premier Doug Ford, we're just going to do that. We're going to expand the subway system, and we're going to create a whole new rider experience for the people of Toronto, the user of the TTC, and we're going to create a regional network that works for the riders of the region. Order. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Good morning, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the question. Uh, Deputy Premier, uh, for almost 20 years in my entire career, I've been fighting for the next generation here in Ontario. I've worked as a youth worker. I've worked as a as a, um, I've organized Family Literacy Day, I've run uh, a literacy, or literacy organization, um, I've worked as an MPP and, of course, as the Minister for Children and Youth Services. But, Deputy Premier, uh, I'm concerned that over the last 10 months we've seen so many cuts that are particularly uh, targeting young people. Increase in class sizes uh, by 27 per cent, elimination of 3,000 teaching positions, cut to children with autism services, the cancellation of after-school programs, summer employment, employment programs, the elimination of children, the child advocate, the cut to post-secondary budgets by 5 per cent, the cancellation of free tuition, the scrapping of Ontario's first French-speaking university, cuts to mental health, question. and so much more. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Deputy, my question to the deputy Premier, Deputy Premier, why are your cuts targeting young people here in the province of Ontario? Government side, come to order. Deputy Premier, to reply. To the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Don't get up, please, children, Community and Social Services. I want to say thank you very much to the Deputy Premier for referring this question to me because the, between herself, the Minister of Education, and so many more ministries, we are for the first time in Ontario's history taking a whole of government approach in the matters of education, in the matters of health care for our children and youth across this province. That is why we are engaging, and we are right now in the process of appointing three tables, one for children in the justice system, one for children in our uh, Indigenous well, uh, child welfare system, as well as for our children in uh, the welfare system as a broad whole. We are working together through wraparound supports to support children with autism, which is why we doubled the funding, an historic funding announcement of over $600 million in just the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services alone, in addition to the supports provided through the health care system, in addition to the supports that are provided to the tune of over $3 billion Spons. for children with special needs in our education system. This is a government that is for the people, but more importantly, Speaker, it's for the children. Supplementary. Okay, Mr. Speaker, I'll ask a, a question about a specific program. In 2017, the previous Liberal government put forward a program to support black youth here in the province of Ontario. It was a $47 million commitment when fully implemented would support over 10,000 young black children here in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, over the last 10 months, the 80 programs that were funded, they haven't heard a word from the government. All the information that was on the website has been removed. All of the grants have been removed from the website. And um, we know, Mr. Speaker, that this is a, bla a blatant way to remove funding for some of the most vulnerable kids in our city. So my question is to the Deputy Premier. 
Why are you removing much-needed uh, funding to some of the most vulnerable children here in the province of Ontario? And I heard a few weeks ago the Question. minister responsible for, responsible for children said that no one in this government will ever, ever apologize for the best social, social program, which is a job. Speci yeah, yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, our program. Thank you. Thank you. Minister to reply. Thank you very much, Speaker. I, I appreciate the opportunity to respond to this because uh, when he was the former Minister of Children and Youth and Community and Social, uh, Social Services, we had the opportunity to work together, and he introduced me to somebody uh, who is a mutual friend of both of ours now, Farley Flex, who has been engaged with my ministry and who I'm uh, planning to encourage uh, to do a lot of work with youth at risk across the province. Uh, we are taking our time. As you know, the budget will come forward on Thursday. But let me be perfectly clear for uh, children that are at risk, particularly black youth at risk in our major cities, particularly in Toronto and Ottawa. Uh, we are making sure that we continue to extend investments for the internationally recognized Stop Now and Plan, which is why I announced as one of my first acts in this, in this job um, to expand that program across the province of Ontario, in particular in the uh, city of Ottawa, where I reside, where we were able to do that. But let me be perfectly clear. This government is committed to ensuring that children who are overrepresented in, uh, in the child welfare system, as well as the, uh, as well as the youth justice uh, system, which is overwhelmingly Indigenous or Black Black youth, we are committed to making sure we have better outcomes for all of those children. Thank you. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, our government made a commitment to the people of Ontario that we would create good jobs. And early in our mandate, We've done exactly that, over 75,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker, in Amazing. under a year. Amazing. Imagine how many jobs will be created as we move forward with our Open for Business mandate, eliminating the barriers that have been holding businesses back for the past 15 years. Our government is focusing on major job-creating sectors, but we aren't forgetting how important local economies can be in Northern Ontario. Unlike the Liberals, our government will never discriminate by region. Can the minister please tell the members of this House how a recent investment in Algoma is unlocking the potential in Northern Ontario? Yeah. Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Flamborough, Glanbrook, who's actually a Nickel Belt girl, born and raised in Cape Real, Mr. Speaker. She cares deeply. She cares, she cares deeply about what we're doing in Northern Ontario, and as we uh, renew and reset the focus of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, we're making sure that we're making strategic investments in businesses, large, small and large, Mr. Speaker, focused on product diversification, new products, Mr. Speaker, and most importantly, creating jobs. That's why we were pleased to announce a $50,000 grant to secure a trademark and purchasing equipment uh, for the manufacturing facility located in Batchewana First Nations. Black Box Fishing, Mr. Speaker, has got a great idea. They make an ice fishing rod holder that automatically sets the hook when a fish bites. Now, I hope ice uh, fishing season is soon over, Mr. Speaker, but I can't Response. wait to try it next year, and I can't wait to stand up with that manufacturer That's and the three new jobs on. that they've created, Mr. Speaker, and celebrate good products made in Northern Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, it is clear that opening Ontario for business is at the heart of our plan to make Ontario the economic powerhouse of this nation. Yep. And that means creating good paying jobs, but also means protecting them right across Ontario, especially in the north. And I'm proud that our government is injecting new life into Northern Ontario's economy. And I'd like to thank the minister for his unwavering commitment to protecting thank good paying jobs in Northern communities. Everyone in this House knows what a major employer the steel industry is in this province. It provides families with the means to put food on their table. Can the minister please tell the members of this House how our government is standing up for the hardworking men and women in the steel industry, including those in Sault Ste. Marie? Minister to reply. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it makes me proud to say that Ontario is only as good as Northern Ontario is strong, Mr. Speaker. We provide a lot of important resources that, over the course of time, have made Ontario's, Ontario uh, the economic engine of this country. We hope to get back to that place, and one of the ways that we're going to do it, Mr. Speaker, is to support large manufacturers in Northern Ontario. Case in point, Sault Ste. Marie. They've got a great 
member of provincial oh. parliament, a strong oh. advocate. He knew that the largest private sector employer in that city, Mr. Speaker, needed help. We were there for them, Mr. Speaker. Not only were we protecting jobs, we were creating jobs and protecting pensioners. This uh, Algoma Steel employs 3,000 people, and there's good news. Algoma Steel has hired more than 240 new people this year, Smitty, Response. in the first half, and they're going to be hiring even more in this year. Mr. Speaker, we stand up for large employers in Northern, on, uh, Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, because we know Northern, a strong Northern Ontario is a strong Thank you. Next question, member for Temiskaming-Cochrane. Thank you. My question is to the Solicitor General. The Toronto Star reported that the Special Investigations Unit, which conducts investigations into circumstances involving police and civilians that resulted in serious injury, sexual assault, or death, is bracing for significant cuts to its budget. In a note to sent, sent to employees, SIU is expecting a 30 percent cut to their budget. Oh. 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 Speaker. Will SIU see a reduction in their budget on April 11? Question is to the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. I would refer this question to the Attorney General. Questions referred to the Attorney General. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I read with great interest the story in the Toronto Star. Um, I can confirm today that uh, the uh, the report is incorrect. Uh, that is uh, not true. Uh, we, uh, the, the SIU uh, will be waiting, just like all other agencies, uh, for, uh, for April 1st, but our government is committed to giving SIU the resources that it needs to do the work that, it, that, that we need it to do. We worked very hard. I, my ministry has worked hard with uh, the Ministry of the Solicitor General to ensure effective oversight and respect for police go once again in the province of Ontario hand in hand, unlike uh, how, the way it's operated for the last 15 years under the Liberals. And so we will make Response. sure that the SIU is properly resourced, um, and uh, I, I, you know, we will wait until April 15th for further information. Supplementary. The SIU plays an important accountability and oversight role and helps build trust between civilians and police. But this government has already significantly curtailed SIU's mandate in a way that the outgoing SIU director said would, and I quote, reduce public confidence in the SIU, end quote. A 30 percent cut to SIU's budget and a scaling back of their mandate means SIU will not have the resources it needs to protect the integrity of our police force. Does the minister think reducing police accountability and oversight is a good thing? The Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, the budget's on April 11th, not whatever I said, so <laughs> to clarify the record. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, our government was very proud to introduce the comprehensive uh, Ontario Policing Services Act, which once again restored trust and respect in police, which go hand in hand with effective oversight. Uh, policing oversight must be transparent and fair in order to have the confidence of the people of this province, and that is what our, our legislation has done. We fixed Bill 175, we restored tr uh, faith and trust of the people of Ontario in policing oversight. But let me be clear, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the SIU mandate was clarified. It now focuses investigative resources where it needs to be, where they need to be focused on criminal activity. But, Mr. Speaker, at the same Response. time, we have implemented Justice Tulloch's recommendations to ensure that oversight is even more independent than it was under the Liberals' Bill 175. The people of Ontario can have confidence once again in policing oversight in the province. Thank you. <laughs> Next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Solicitor General. Mr. Speaker, the Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre, also known as EMDC, has been the setting of many tragedies and ongoing problems that have violated the sense of security of correctional officers who go to work each day to keep our communities safe. Correctional officers have, been ch have a challenging job as they work to manage risks of inmate violence on a daily basis, as well as issues related to crime, mental health, and addictions. Families of inmates who have passed away are forced to confront these heartbreaking issues, and they should not be forced to carry this burden alone. Mr. Speaker, 
Can the Solicitor General please tell this Question. House how our government is working to fix the problems left by the previous Liberal government to ensure the safety of correctional officers, staff, and inmates at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member from Chatham. Kent Leamington. You know, I, I have to say this uh, member, with his many years of advocacy while we were in opposition, has been incredibly helpful with advice and insight. Beautiful so voice. I very much appreciate your, uh, your help with that. And, um, the, the very first uh, tour and meeting that I had with frontline correction staff was uh, at the urging of the Minister of Transportation because as the member locally, he understands how important this is to the families and the community. And I want to assure uh, the families of uh, individuals who have died of overdoses or deaths in our institution that they will not uh, walk the path alone. Uh, we are actively uh, working on addressing some of the issues, specifically uh, in Middlesex. I want to highlight that we've already taken immediate action. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Solicitor General, not only for your kind comments, but also for your response to this very serious issue. You know, these actions to support our frontline staff are needed to address the problems afflicting Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre. Mr. Speaker, as a member of this government, I'm encouraged to know that we are facing these stark challenges head-on and giving our frontline staff the additional tools and supports they need to keep themselves and those in our custody safe. I know the Solicitor General will continue to deliver on this government's commitment to ensuring safety is job one in Ontario's corrections system. Mr. Speaker, could the Solicitor General please share more about how our government's Question. plan to make Elgin Middlesex Detention Centre even safer. So that's your general. Speaker, and I will try to talk faster. So immediately we've put safety first by providing enhanced safety training for all staff, increasing the number of random cell searches. We are using a canine unit to detect and serve as a deterrent to contraband, specifically drugs. We will, uh, we are having a, a dedicated hospital escort team that was pilot, piloted in December, uh, which is working out very well. We've also test piloted ion scanners at the Elgin Middlesex Detention Center. These scanners can identify trace elements of drugs and will be used to detect contraband on inmate mail. Uh, we have hired uh, additional addictions counselors and three new social workers. I I want to assure the people of Elgin Middlesex that we are actively working on making sure that this institution Response. is the safest that it can be. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for St. Catharines. Good morning, Speaker. To the Minister of Transportation. For over a year, the City of St. Catharines and the Niagara Region have been advocating to have barriers installed on the Burgoyne Bridge after six residents since October have taken their own lives. Mayor Sensick City Council are doing their part to advocate for funding through the Niagara region, but the minister also has a hand in ensuring drivers under the bridge remain safe while traveling along the busy 406 Provincial Highway. Two letters from my office have been sent to the minister asking the minister to fund these barriers for the safety of the traveling public, and unfortunately, our last letter has gone unacknowledged. Mr. Speaker, will the Minister of Transportation acknowledge the barriers are necessary to protect the citizens with possibly mental health issues and drivers traveling Question. along the 406 highway and commit to funding this life-saving measure? Thank you. Questions to the Minister of Transportation. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and thanks for that question. Uh, we've had that conversation in the House a couple of times here, and we have received letters on it. Uh, I, I did remind the member at the time that it is a municipal bridge, and I'm looking forward to MTO has offered to help them in any technical uh, ways or support them in their decision to fund uh, the supports on their municipal bridge. We are very serious in this side of the House of 
dealing with the mental health crisis that's occurring throughout this province. Our government has promised to match the federal funding and create a new mental health system. And I'm proud to say that we have the best uh, Minister of Health in place to, to, to put this process forward. Uh, we are going to look forward to put supports the people that uh, are, are not are are falling through the cracks and not getting the, the supports that they need. But I, I just remind the member opposite that it is a municipal bridge. We're there to support the municipality. I hope they come Response. forward with a decision and uh, in order to, uh, come to come to, order. to a conclusion on this issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. That concludes question period for this morning. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has informed me that he has a point of order. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I, I just want to take this opportunity to introduce to the House a uh, frequent visitor and a constituent of mine from Leeds Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Alexandra Profassi Horning is here. Normally she I've seen her here with her husband Paul and her daughters Peyton and Taylor, but uh, I want to welcome her here again today. Thank you. I understand the uh, member for Don Valley North has a point of order. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the afternoon, grade five students from Upper Grand Public School from my riding of Don Valley North will be visiting Queen's Park on a field trip. I would like to welcome them to the legislature in advance. I hope they enjoy their visit. Right on, right on. Member for Guelph has a point of order. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to welcome Abhiji Bene, the Deputy Leader of the Green Party of Ontario, to Queen's Park today. <laughs> Minister of Infrastructure is appointed. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome uh, the team from Tri Recycling, who's at Queen's Park today, and my constituent, Jim Graham. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. This house stands in recess until 3 p.m.